Transformative Principle, episode 107, with Nathan Adams. Nathan Adams is a special ed teacher in Juneau, Alaska, and we're going to talk about his teacher-led professional development that he's doing with his school and district, and I hope that you get a lot out of this. If you would like to learn how to be a transformative principal yourself, you can get the top five things that I've learned from interviewing all these amazing principals over 100 episodes by signing up for the newsletter and getting that freebie by signing up at transformativeprincipal.org. Thanks so much for listening. Please share this with your friends and colleagues, and let's make a lot of transformative principles. Welcome to Transformative Principal. Today, I am excited to have Nathan Adams with me, who's a eight-year special education teacher in the Juneau School District. And uh, we met on the Alaska Ed Chat, which is hashtag AK Ed Chat, which happens Monday nights that my assistant principal, Damon Hargraves, and I and a few other great people in the state started talking about. And then we decided, let's just do one. So in our second one, Nathan started talking about teacher-led professional development, and I thought that it sounded really great, and so I wanted to have him on. Thank you, Nathan, for being on the podcast today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Why don't we start by talking about how you got into the teacher-led professional development and how it works in in your school district? Okay, so the teacher-led professional development is that we're doing is being run through our local NEA organization. So our local union organization in the school district. And the way that it got started was last year in, as, as I was teaching, I decided to become involved in our union, which is an affiliate of NEA, NEA Alaska. And as part of a way to give back to an organization that has bolstered and supported me over the, you know, the past couple of years. And so one of the things that I did was I ended up going to a training for how to be a building representative. And at that training, the um, lady that was leading it asked us what it was that we wanted to get or what we wanted to do for our organization, for our union. And I said, I'd love to start offering professional courses. And at the time I was kind of thinking, professional courses between regular education teachers and special education teachers so that we can have a better understanding of the nuances of, of special education and law and have um, being able to educate regular education teachers who are in the classroom working with these kids exactly what it is that the documents that we're giving them mean, what it is that we're trying to do, what it is that we're doing, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of my intention getting into this. But as I was discussing it with the training person, she indicated that the Anchorage School District, it's actually the Anchorage Education Association, just received a grant through NEA to start doing teacher-led professional developments. And if I would start to do, would be interested in that? And I said, absolutely. And that was something that I wanted to do. And one of the reasons that I became involved just this last year with our local union organization is not necessarily the labor and the contract and the, the rights portions of the union. I, I certainly attend those meetings and hear that stuff, but it's not something that I'm passionate about, not something that I, as an individual, am interested in, even though it's something that I've benefited from. One of the ways that I view our unions is as kind of a, a fraternity or a brotherhood or, or of of professionals that this is our career, this is our profession. We're from classroom teacher to para support personnel to principal to the PTA. We're there for the kids, um, and we're there to to bolster the learning of of our community. And it is a very community sort of perspective that I have about this. And so NEA uh, and JEA and our union is one mechanism with which that we can bolster education as a profession. And so that's how I got started in this as, as a way to come out and say, this is who we are, this is what we want, and uh, we're going to do it. I, let me interrupt you for just a second. I like I like that approach of that we're here to not so much for the labor, but to help make sure that we're producing the best people 
we can in front of our kids and helping support that. I like how you said the brotherhood of professionals. I think that's a good way to, um, to think of that when you're learning about all this stuff, you're just hearing about it. You haven't actually experienced any of this in your profession yet. Is that correct? No, we've offered, uh, one course this year. So I have been sent to, to trainings by the Juno school district to offer special education trainings to other special education teachers. And so I have received other trainings and I have taught classes through the school district as part of professional developments. But this is um, something that we're doing outside the school district. And we ran one class this fall that was on education technology. And we um, held it Tuesday nights for five consecutive Tuesdays for three hours for uh, 15 hours to get the one academic credit that is available through the UA system for that so that our teachers could receive um, continuing education credits uh, for their recertification and also advancement and movements on the uh, salary schedule. So I think that's uh, that's pretty cool. What trainings did you go to to learn about how to do this in the way that would make it count for credits for continuing ed- education? Because we can train all we want, but if it doesn't actually count, then there's a, a lesser incentive to participate. What kind of training did you have to do to learn how to do that? I, I think that you're... I want to touch on something here where I think that it's completely accurate that we can, we have to encourage people to seek these trainings. I mean, there's a certain, certain percentage of people that are completely intrinsically motivated to do absolutely everything, but everybody has a breaking point. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to be able to offer this for credit so that our younger members, our newer members, could continue to improve their skills and advance through the salary schedule and so that our veteran teachers could also just continue to hone their practice and get the recertification through the state of Alaska. And so what we ended up doing in order to make this as successful as we could was through the NEA's grant, we uh, went to a training training session through CTA, the California Teachers Association, that has a division entirely set up to professional developments for educators, for teachers teaching teachers. And I can't, they've got a whole list of acronym soups there. I think it's the Institute of Professional Development, IPD, and then the course was called, I can't remember the course, but it has another series of professional, um, of acronyms. And IPD is the organization within California Teachers Association. Larger states have these organizations or have these these programs within them. Washington State has one, for example, but California, being such a massive state, is one of the few states that has an entire division devoted towards teacher professional development or teachers teaching teachers. And when we were there, um, there were a handful of teachers from a variety of school districts around California who were learning how to run professional developments for uh, bringing them back to their home districts. Cool. So you have, this is something where you're doing it um, outside of what the school district is offering, but how aligned to what the school district is doing are you? Yeah, we are doing this outside the school district. We're doing this on evenings and weekends. Uh, The people that are taking the classes are volunteering um, their time to do it. it. It's nothing that is compensated in any way on the teacher's part. We are in communication with the school district, um, with the administration for developments. This year, we have not aligned it to what it is, to their um, professional developments and intentions because we they had already set their assessment calendar by the time we were starting to get this our classes rolling. Next year, we're going to perhaps co-plan with the school district to set um, an assessment calendar with what it is that they want all teachers to know and learn and be able to do, which is completely valid and I completely support it versus what we want all teachers through. And when I say we want, it's uh, we're self-identifying through surveys. So we survey our members, survey other teachers to see what it is that they want to learn about, what it is that they want to do. 
and design courses around teacher-driven topics and ideas. Okay, that's cool. So what are the topics that you have already done for the 15 hours you did already? And what do you have coming down the pike? So as teachers um, that are running this program, and there are a variety of us, we typically meet on Sunday afternoons and we sit down and we begin planning courses and sessions. And we're going to sit down for our first Sunday afternoon after our last course tomorrow, today being a Saturday evening, and begin planning out the next course. When we surveyed the um, teachers in the fall, our members in the fall, the top two, we provided a, a couple of options and then we said other, just go ahead and write something in. And the top two results that we got back were education technology and um, Marzano, Marzano being the teacher evaluation system that we, uh, the Juno School District selected for the Alaska State Teacher Evaluation. I hate to use the word system again, but the Alaska State Teacher Evaluation Program. So this next course is probably going to be on Marzano and we'll infuse ed tech into it also. Cool. That sounds good. So we're using Marzano also up here and uh, have done a lot of professional development around that. And the the need is is certainly great for being able to understand that better. And uh, so I'm glad you're you're doing something with that. I think that's good. So when you're offering this to your members, are only association members allowed to participate or is it open to anyone who can come? Well, so what we, we decided that as a, um, that as an organization, as an institution, that we would have certain perks and benefits for association members as, as funds. So we don't have the same grant funding that AEA, that the Anchorage Education Association did. And so we're funding this all internally through our own dues. And so for the, the little perks that we're offering, like dinner and that sort of thing to our members, that is something that we would kind of respect as, or try to hold as members only. But we had a, a variety of people approach us and say, administrators and principals ask if they could come to our sessions. And we decided that, yes, we would make this open. We want this to be, you know, as part of this feeling of community and part of this feeling of supporting kids, um, we want this to be available to anybody. You know, the things that are coming out of our own dues, we'd like to save for our, our paying, our fee paying members. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, what are some of the challenges that you have come across so far in doing this? So some of the challenges that we've come across so far is quite simply because we're doing this on a shoestring budget, finding the time and finding the motivation to get some of this going because, you know, not only are we teachers that, you know, work (laughs) <laughs> at minimum, our contract time, but we're parents and we've got kids and activities and all of the things that we do as adults and as educators is what we do. And so it, it's oftentimes, I think the hardest part is finding the time and finding that that committed core group that are willing to put something else aside to say, this is something I believe in and this is something that I want to do and this is something that I'm willing to give up other parts of my life to be able to, to support and to do. Yeah. When I was a teacher still, I did a thing called technology Tuesdays where every Tuesday I'd have a little professional development session after school for the teachers in my building. And some days we had, you know, one other person there and we just chat about different technology things. And then other days I had a lot more people there and, it was tough to do all my work and then say, oh, yeah, I got this thing on Tuesday that I need to plan for, advertise, and make sure that people get benefit from coming to it. And it was something that was really challenging for me to find the time to do, but so rewarding when it actually worked out. And I'm sure that you have experienced some of those things as well. But what are some of the best things about this that you've seen so far? So through the course... Essentially, the homework each week was for teachers to post a reflection of what they took away and what they implemented, not necessarily what they thought of each evening and, and so on and so forth, but what what little gem they took away and implemented that week. And a lot of our, ed, so our first course was on education technology, and I've been kind of a Google 
Google guy for several years. And as this course was, or as this program was taking shape, I decided, well, you know, I should go ahead and get some Google certifications. And so I, I sat down at the computer and um, became a Google certified educator, both level one and then level two. And I'm currently working on the certification for Google certified trainer. But the 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 courses that we offered each Tuesday evening over five Tuesdays, we had a variety of teachers come in and, and lead different sessions. I led two evenings by myself on Google stuff. And then um, one evening where I shared with other educators where I focused on some Google stuff and some non-Google stuff. And then we had other teachers come in and show other web-based applications. That was one of the things that as a group that was planning this course that we wanted to emphasize, we wanted this to be something that everybody had equal access to and it wasn't dependent upon whether or not you had specialized software in whatever computer lab. So through this whole process, we would have teachers learning different things on either Google or other education applications. We aligned all of our education applications kind of to, to Marzano and we asked teachers to to focus on different elements of Marzano as they implemented these things in their classroom. And so they would come back each week at the end of the week and say um, what it is that they implemented in their classroom and how it went or if they didn't get a chance to implement something, what they thought they might and, and try. And teachers seemed really responsive and receptive to the things that uh, we did or could have done. And it forced me as a presenter to to differentiate my instruction in a way that I hadn't done before because now I was differentiating for adults as opposed to students uh, and we had people showing up just like any other classroom we had people showing up who had difficulty attaching something to an email all the way up to people who could quite honestly have been leading the presentation that I was giving and we went from there. Yeah. And that's, that's certainly a challenge. It's a challenge in our classrooms and it's a challenge with adults as well. What advice would you have for someone who wants to, to start having a teacher's directing teachers, teaching teachers, professional development in their school or district? What, what advice do you have for them? It's nothing magical. Um, it's nothing very complicated. I mean, we are educators. That is what we do. And what you have to do is just go through the mind shift of, Instead of educating a I'll pick somewhere in the middle, twelve-year-old, um, you're now educating a I don't know, forty-two-year-old, and so you you change your language, you change some of the things that you do, but you keep the same solid education practices that you know work and that you know are true, and you perhaps take some that work for you that others may not know about and you demonstrate it. And so one of the things that we were doing is that we wanted to demonstrate a variety of different educational strategies. And this was something that I think the, the Anchorage Education Association did fantastically well was that when I was in their course there, I learned a bunch of new educational strategies that I hadn't had experience with before. And it, it never felt demeaning. I never felt like I was being talked to like I was a 12-year-old sort of a thing. It, I felt like I was, you know, a 35, a 35-year-old professional sitting in a room with other teachers. And at the same time, I have the knowledge to see that what they're doing is that they're engaging me in a way in which they would engage the kids in their classroom while treating everybody with the same sort of dignity that they would treat the students in their classroom. So that's one trick. And other than that, it's be a professional educator. Yeah. I mean, it's that advice is very simple. Continue to use good teaching strategies and don't treat the adults like children, but still engage them and challenge them and, and do those things. I think that's great advice and it's something that's very simple, but it's easy to overlook. And I'm sure you've seen videos that people posted online of professional development where the person who's leading it is treating everybody like a little child and that's not nobody likes that even the kids don't like it to be honest yeah. so that's not not a good idea i actually try to avoid those things online <laughs> yeah that's that's probably wise i try to avoid the the videos of 
teachers yelling at kids and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good idea. But I do want to uh, change gears a little bit and talk about your new at your school this year. And um, you chose to come to your school for, for a specific reason. Why don't you talk about that for a second? So I'm a special education teacher and I was working in a, a specialized program with um, behavior disorder students last year. And what our district decided to do was create effectively magnet schools for the different specialized portions of special education. So the behavior disorders or what we would consider the, the more severe disabilities and that sort of thing. And so my job was being combined last year and it was going to a school site that um, already had a teacher in it who is in her own right a very top-notch educator. And so I had the opportunity to, to transfer and our district administration just said, uh, sent me an email in the spring, said, okay, Nathan, here are four options. And I chose moving to elementary school, which is something that I'd never done before. But the reason that I chose moving to elementary school is because the principal that was going to be leading that school the next year was a brand new hire. He was a teacher um, from the classroom that I knew and respected very much. And I chose to transfer to that school largely on the basis of who the principal was going to be as a, uh, a first-year principal. So what is it about that principal that made you want to go there? You, you said already that you had worked with him and and you respected him. What was it that made you think that he would be a good leader to have at the school? On the surface, one of the reasons that I wanted to um, go with him is, is that he was, in his own right, also a technology leader and a teacher leader for education technology and adaption or adoption of ed tech. And so that was one thing. And that was actually how I knew him mostly. The other reason that I wanted to go work with him was it's hard to describe what qualities make a leader when you kind of look at a leader. But He's uh, an individual that is very personable. He know, he understands the, the the field, and he knows kids, and he knows what it takes to educate a classroom. His he was a fourth grade teacher, and he was coming out of the fourth grade classroom, and he was known throughout the district, and then also on a small scale, kind of nationally, as a fantastic um, teacher of writing. Writing was his passion, uh, and he led some professional developments in writing before he became a principal through different, um, well, through the university and through um, other organizations. Cool. So you were also telling me that he had an opportunity to work with, uh, he was chosen by Arnie Duncan for something. Can you talk a little bit about that? He was a part of a U.S. Ed Teaching Ambassador Fellow for 2013-2014. And so he was a teaching ambassador for the U.S. Department of Education, and he spent in 2013, 2014, a fair amount of time in Washington, D.C. with Arne Duncan and uh, another number of other selected teachers. So that seems like a, a pretty big deal, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it is a big deal. I mean, and this is these are things that he did as not all of us, I, I never expect to be uh, named uh, teacher of the year, either in the district or in the state or certainly not in the nation. But um, as an educator, while Tom, our, our principal, has not been teacher of the year, he he is a good, solid educator and he knows he knows education. He knows kids. Yeah. And what are some of the things that he's doing now that are meeting your expectations that you had coming in that are that are motivating to you as a as a veteran teacher who probably is pretty good in your own right. Well, so one of the things that I appreciate about Tom, um, and he he kind of refocused doing this here after our uh, our winter break and holiday, is that in his weekly emails to the staff, you know, so Sunday evening, um, I can expect to get an email from him that kind of outlines big agenda items for the week. Oh, so here's a little thing that he does. So staff meetings, we don't, I mean, we could all just meet in the library for staff meetings, but he's rotating through classrooms. 
each week for staff meetings. And so we all get to meet in another teacher's classroom to see the classroom and just be in that environment and to see that environment, which is not something that we all get to do. And, you know, I was thinking on my, I'm, I'm taking a tangent here, but I was thinking on my drive in the other day that I, in many ways, envy staff like paraeducators and paraprofessionals because they don't know how lucky they are to get the opportunity to visit other teachers' classrooms and just sit down and kind of watch them teach as they interact with the kids. And that's something that we, as educators, don't always get an opportunity to do. We don't, If we leave our classroom, it's to go make photocopies or to go to the restroom or to, to go to the front office to get a form to fill out for Johnny who, you know, threw rocks at recess or something. You know, it's it's one of those sorts of things that we don't get to see other teachers in action all the time. And so as a little thing for staff meetings, Tom changes the room each week and we're going through other teachers' classrooms. And, you know, for the primary grades, we get to sit in the tiny chairs. And for the the older grades, we get to, you know, maybe squeeze into a desk. And that's something that he does. And then what I started speaking about in his weekly emails here is that in his emails, he asks questions specific leading and pointed questions about what it is that we're going to try to do that week, what it is that we're going to do that might be new, interesting, different, dynamic, what are our hopes or aspirations to get out of our classroom and out of our kids that week, what is what is it that is interesting that or exciting that we might want to do. And then the other thing that he asks um, is how he might be able to support us either in that or in some other way, what is it that he need? what is it that we need him to be able to do? Huh, cool. And then quite frankly, as a special education teacher, the very last thing that he does, which is absolutely critical and fundamental as far as I'm concerned, is that he's organized and he keeps a timeline. And if I set a meeting, he shows up and he's not more than three minutes late sort of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Those are Definitely important. Well, I appreciate your uh, time um, on the podcast today. The last question I ask everybody is, what advice do you have for people who are listening to this podcast of how to be a transformative principal? One of the things that I appreciate is when leaders, you know, and it's up to the leader's judgment because you, you clearly can't do this with everybody, but you have to you have to trust the people that are working for you. And when you trust the people that are working for you, you can empower them to do something new and interesting and something dynamic. And it's that empowerment of, of a pet project, such as if a teacher is really interested in, I don't know, maybe integrating art and science that week and, and doing something with the color spectrum and empower that classroom teacher to do it and, and to encourage them and to support them along the way through whatever little thing it is that the, that they have self-identified as an interest and in product that they want to to create or to do a new unit or a new lesson. Yeah, that sounds great. Again, thank you so much. How can people learn more from you and uh, get in contact with you? Well, I have a, a web page that I hardly use, but I do. I am on Twitter, and I, I find Twitter to be my favorite form of social media. Uh, my Twitter account is at JNU, which is the airport code for Juneau, Alaska, JNU Rain. Cool. Thanks again for your time, Nathan. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to Transformative Principle. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. You can follow the podcast on Facebook at facebook.com slash transformative principle or on Twitter at TRNFRM principle. Transformative Principle is a proud member of the Edu Podcast Network at edupodcastnetwork.com. If you're looking for something new and different, try the Dads in Ed podcast. Great podcast. Give it a listen.